Okay, we're going to continue today with the combinational logic lectures that you started. Remember, we start with the transistor as the building block, and then we started building logic gates on top of that. We're going to do more and more of that, and we're going to look at how to minimize those logic circuits using Boolean algebra, uh, which many of you are familiar with, I believe. I'll ask the question later on. And then hopefully we'll transition into hardware description languages. This will be another language that you will learn in this course. Uh, it's a hardware description language. It's very log like we briefly discussed last time. It's used to design hardware, essentially. OK, so before we go into uh, the lecture, many of you have been doing the optional assignment, which is really the review of my uh, inaugural lecture. Not these lectures. Some of you have submitted review of these lectures. That's not what I'm looking for. You won't get credit if you submit review of these lectures. You'll get credit if you submit review of the inaugural lecture, which is over here. And uh, basically, if you if you're, I, I've been reading these summaries, actually. Some of them are quite good. Thank you for submitting them. Uh, some of them may need work. If you want feedback, let me know. Uh, uh, basically, you'll get extra credit. Uh, and that's not an ECTS credit, if you remember from last time. That's 1% from for this course. And it helps, basically. It, it's not bad, right? So I've changed the mode of uh, submission. So if, if you're, some of you are still submitting via email, but if you saw Juan's email yesterday, We've changed the mode of submission to uh, such that you can upload a, a PDF file to Moodle because email is really cumbersome. We cannot really collect everything over email. It's very error prone. So you'll, please upload your PDF file of the assignment uh, to Moodle. Deadline, we've set a deadline. It's March uh, 15th, next Friday. Is it next Friday? It is next Friday. OK. I'm not losing the dates yet. Uh, so it's next Friday. So please do it before deadline. Uh, if you would like to get the extra credit, that's not required. Uh, as you can see. And some of you have been submitting more than one page. That's OK. Two pages is OK. Just don't make it too long, right? It's... OK, uh, so required readings, I'll emphasize this. So right now, we're starting slowly. We're building basics uh, for what will come next. So these are the lectures that you should really, really learn and do the readings a lot. Because in the future lectures, we'll not have a lot of readings. So it may look like you'll have a lot of readings at the beginning of the semester. But that's intentional because that will build up to future lectures. So this is uh, what we're going to cover. Uh, well, we've started covering last week and this week. That's combinational logic. And basically, we will be done, hopefully, with chapter two today. I cannot promise fully. Uh, and this week, we will cover hardware description languages and Verilog. And uh, Harris and Harris chapter four is all about hardware description languages. Some of it is too detailed, but if you read it, uh, you will learn a lot. And sequential logic, we will cover uh, again, hopefully tomorrow. My, my hope is that we will cover most of combinational logic and sequential logic by the end of this week, uh, as well as hardware description languages. And next week, we will start with timing and verification. And then we will start building up to the microarchitecture levels. So these readings are extremely important. Please, please do them. OK, so this is uh, where we uh, left off, uh, combinational logic circuits and design. I'm going to jog your memory a little bit. I said that that's what we were going to learn last time. Let me make this a bit bigger on my end. Basically, you started with transistor as the building block. You remember NMOS, PMOS. I'll, I'll give you an example of it again. And then we start building logic gates from transistors. And that's really the basics. Uh, we drew the abstraction level at the transistor. Right? If you go, want to be, go below the abstraction level and learn how transistors operate, you should take a microelectronic design course uh, from ETET or even a physics course where they teach transistors. OK, today we're going to talk about Boolean algebra. How many of you know about Boolean algebra? So you studied it in high school. OK, so some of this is going to be easy. But I'm going to give you a circuit perspective of it. And then we're going to try to minimize circuits using Boolean algebra. So it's going to be fun, basically. And then we're going to go into more combinational circuits, different building blocks like selectors, decoders, programmable logic arrays, uh, adders. And then we're going to talk about Boolean algebra to represent the circuits. And we're going to minimize the circuits. I'm, I'm hoping that we will actually finish all of this today. So this is just for your recall. This is what we uh, constructed last time. This is a NOT gate in CMOS, uh, transistor level, gate level, truth table. And you do that for the NAND gate, transistor level, truth table, gate level. And this is an AND gate, and transistor level, truth table, and the gate level uh, example of it. And we said uh, NAND uh, inverting logic is a lot easier than CMOS for the reasons that we've discussed. Uh, yeah, and uh, basically NMOS transistors are good at pulling down uh, the output to zero volts. Pulling down means pull down the value on the wire to zero volts. That's why they're placed at the bottom as a pull down network. 
they're connected to the ground, whereas PMOS transistors are good at pulling up uh, the output into three volts. As a result, they're placed up here. And when you connect things that way, PMOS transistors up top and NMOS transistors at the bottom, you basically get inverting logic. If you were able to do it the opposite way, then you could get non-inverting logic, then you could easily get an AND gate and NOR gate, but it's not easy to do because the transistors just don't work that way. They lose a lot of, uh, they're basically not good transmitters uh, uh, if, if they're placed the other way. NMOS is not good at transmitting a three volt uh, into the uh, drain, and PMOS is not good at transmitting zero volt, basically. That's, they, they're not good conductors at that point. Okay, if you really want to learn the details of this, you need to take the microwave product design course. So this is a general CMOS gate structure that I alluded to. Basically, uh, we can use this to build uh, many gates, any inverting logic gate. This is a PMOS pull-up network pulling up to three volts or VDD, and NMOS pull-down network pulling down to the zero volts, the ground. And as we said, the networks may consist of transistors in series and parallel, and this is very similar to what you've seen in the past in resistors, right? If things are in series, then they're slower because their resistances add up. If they're things that are in parallel, then they're faster because you have parallel paths uh, that can conduct uh, in different ways. So, and then when transistors are in parallel, the network is on, and uh, if one of the transistors is on, when transistors are in series, the network is on only if all transistors are on. Okay, and we've already said this, uh, so I'm not gonna repeat it. This is where we stopped. I'll very co uh, cover this quickly because energy consumption, power consumption is uh, going to be even more important going into the future. Uh, and you can read this more in more detail in Harris and Harris, I think 1.8 or 1.7 that you will see over there. So there are two types of power consumption that's drawn uh, in a circuit. Uh, one is dynamic. Dynamic means when the circuit is switching, when the circuit is transmitting something. And static is me means that when the circuit is not uh, transmitting anything, it's not switching basically. So uh, uh, there, there's power drawn when you're not switching because somehow there's leakage from the uh, uh, for, from the a VDD to the ground, and that leakage increases as the size of the transistor goes down, so this leakage is a much bigger problem today, actually. Even if you're not switching, even if you're not doing anything with the circuit, it's leaking. So let's take a look at uh, the case where the circuit is switching. So if the circuit is switching, you can think of uh, the circuit as a capacitor, and you're charging and discharging the circuit. And the charging and discharging frequency is F, how, how often you're doing this. And uh, the capacitance of the circuit and the supply voltage of the circuit, how much current, uh, uh, how, uh, you're, 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 uh, basically the energy consumption of the circuit, uh, of the capacitor is CV square. And if you do it at some rate, you'll get the power consumption. The power consumption is essentially CV square F. And you can see that this is proportional quadratically to voltage over here. Make sense? And the frequency of switching actually is determined. It's not expressed over here but how fast you can switch a circuit uh, is usually determined by how fast you can run the circuit, clearly, and that is usually determined by how, how much voltage you supply into the circuit. So that's also proportional to voltage, which is not shown here, which means that dynamic power consumption has a cubic relationship uh, voltage, which means that if you want to reduce the uh, power consumption of a circuit, fundamentally, you would like to reduce the voltage as much as possible, and that's what, uh, that's what many systems try to do today. So they want to try to reduce the voltage during operation as much as possible, okay? And this is also called dynamic voltage scaling, for example, when you're not, uh, when you don't need that speed, you actually scale the voltage down. Okay, static power consumption is also dependent on voltage. So voltage is bad, basically. High voltage operation is bad for power. You, you would know that because you, you knew, you learned physics before, right? But probably you've seen this equation and not necessarily this equation as much. Uh, so static power means that you basically uh, are leaking current even when you're not switching. And this is proportional to the how much, how much current is being le uh, leaked and what is the supply voltage? What is the delta between the supply voltage and the ground? And as you can see, that's, uh, that's a simple equation. Uh, clearly, if you want to reduce the static power consumption, you want to reduce the supply voltage and you want to reduce the leakage as much as possible. Unfortunately, uh, leakage power increases as you, as, you, uh, as you reduce the size of the transistor and today we're having a bigger problem uh, with leakage. Okay, if you want to consume, uh, compute energy, after, now, now that you know power, what is energy? Anybody? Yes? How much power Exactly, yes. It's power times time, basically. Power is basically ins instantaneous, and then you integrate the power over the time that you're consuming the power under the power curve, basically, you get this. 
So you basically multiply both equations by time and you get energy consumption. And the energy is clearly, uh, it depends how much uh, energy you're drawing out of a battery, for example, and your battery life is very much affected by uh, the energy. Okay, so see more in Harris and Harris chapter 1.8. You won't see much more because it doesn't talk about much more, which is not the uh, level of abstraction we want to go into in this course, but this is really critically important in the design of future systems. That's why you should really know it uh, going forward. We may have some exercise about it uh, later on, maybe, uh, maybe optional exercises. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, this is kind of like a summary. Uh, these are the common logic gates. We didn't examine all of them. Uh, this is, uh, so this is an inverter. Clearly, we've seen some of them over here. Uh, we didn't see the buffer. Buffer is interesting. Uh, what does buffer do? Basically, buffer passes the input to the output. Well, why is it good? It may amplify the input, right? So input may be, it's not at three volts, for example. For, for some reason, because of the resistance on the wire, Oh, and the length of the wire, it lost some of the voltage over time, right, because of interference. It, it was three volts in the beginning and became 2.0 volts. And you don't want 2.0 volts for the, to turn on a transistor or turn off a transistor. So you may actually use a buffer to amplify uh, the voltage back to three volts. And buffer may consist of different kinds of circuitry, but it could be, for example, uh, two inverters, right? Uh, if you have two inverters, that's one way of building a buffer. Maybe that's not the most space efficient way of building a buffer. But basically think about, uh, we, we've been seeing this abstraction as a uh, transistor as perfect, but that's not necessarily perfect underneath. So when you're actually going and designing uh, some of these long transmission lines, long, uh, long wires, you may actually need to add buffers so that you amplify. This is very much similar to sound amplification, right? You lose sound as the sound travels. If you, if you have an amplifier that amplifies the sound, then now you can hear it much better. Okay, so XOR is another interesting one. How many of you know about XOR? Okay, this is exclusive OR. The function basically says that if you have an uh, N input gate, uh, uh, the, the XOR function is true if an odd number of uh, the inputs is one. And basically you can see that over here. Uh, if an odd number of the inputs, if it's a two input XOR, if an odd number of the inputs is one, you get a one output. Otherwise you get zero. In other words, if A is zero and B is one, or A is one and B is zero, you get a one. Now I'm actually uh, giving you a Boolean equation, right? If A bar is true and B is true, or A is true and B bar is true, you get a one. So now I've specified this uh, function in terms of Boolean uh, equation. It's A bar and B, or A and B bar, okay. And XNOR is basically the uh, inverted uh, version of it. It's the complement of XNOR. Uh, XO, uh, XNOR is the complement of XOR. And you can imagine that this is easier to build. So I'll leave, I'll leave it up to you to how to build it. Actually, you can build this with a complex gate, uh, uh, not necessarily consisting of AND and ORs. OK, so we can also build larger gates. Uh, this is hopefully obvious. You can extend the gates to more than two inputs. For example, you can have a three input AND gate. This is easy to imagine, right? And the end gate uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, actually, let's go back very quickly. Sorry about that, there is no ink. So this is the uh, end gate that we have, right? Basically, if you want a three input end gate, you get another input over here. You put another PMOS transistor in parallel and you put another MMOS transistor in parallel and that's your three input end gate. Of course, uh, you need to invert it at the end. So you build a three input NAND first and then an inverter, yes. You can think of it that way, sure, yeah. <laughs> so basically you can, you can take this and add more, that's what you're saying, right? Or no? Yeah, or we can just do one, one of each type of transistor and then we have an inverter. Exactly, you could do that, exactly. You have an inverter at the end, basically. You get a three input NAND, four input NAND, five input NAND, and then have an inverter at the end. Of course, if you actually make these gates uh, larger by adding more transistors, they become slower, right? Why, because the serial path if you have, a, let's say, 100 input NAND over here, let's take a look at that. 100 input NAND means 100 uh, transistors, NMOS transistors in series. That doesn't sound very good, right? 
because that, uh, it takes a long time to travel, and uh, as a result, this becomes very slow. So sometimes it makes a lot more sense not to build these large logic gates. So if you want to build a 100 input NAND for whatever reason, you may want to build it as a hierarchy of different uh, N input NANDs where N is smaller than 100. OK, so there are a lot of trade-offs over here, clearly, that we're not going to go into uh, at this point. But you can build complex gates. You can build a 10 input NOR gate, which is similar to what we've discussed. Uh, but you can also build a 10 input NOR gate as a combination of two input NOR gates. Right. OK, so very quickly, I'll go through this very quickly. I don't uh, want to spend a lot of time. Uh, you, you guys are familiar with Moore's Law, right? Yes? How many of you know about Moore's Law? <laughs> OK, good. So I'll go through this very quickly. Basically, uh, Moore's Law has enabled many, many of these transistors. That's, that's going to be my key point. And this is 2005 over here. You have almost uh, a billion. And this is what Moore actually predicted when he wrote the paper in 1965. This is basically observation. He basically said that uh, uh, this is the number of uh, uh, components that you can in integrate on a device. And it's basically increasing exponentially. This is exponential because this is the log logarithmic scale. Uh, this is 2 to the number of n over here, where n is in the, uh, the value in the y-axis, and this is the year. He basically plotted the values for 1959, 62, 64, and 66 over here. And then you saw that this exponentially increasing. And you could argue about the, uh, how often it's increasing. And you can think that like, the number of transistors that you can uh, cost-efficiently integrate on a component is doubling every two years, for example. Clearly, there's no physical, uh, not necessarily, it's not a physical law. This is more of a what people actually build, right? Because it's related to cost also. So if you look at this graph from the 1965 paper, this is the number of components per integrated circuit on the x-axis. And this is a relative manufacturing cost per component. So basically, over time, cost per component reduces. As a result, you want to integrate more uh, on, a, on a given device. So in 1962, the curve looks like this. If you integrate, I don't know, 15, 20 components over here, uh, you get the lowest cost per component. If you integrate lower, you get less uh, 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 higher costs. If you integrate higher, you get higher cost because you, you don't get good yield, basically. If you keep integrated more, uh, your yield becomes lower because some of them don't work very well. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you integrate less, you're not making as good use of, it, use of your die, basically. And this is getting better, meaning that as transistors become smaller, uh, your, their costs are reducing, and because their cost is reducing, you can integrate more and more of them cost efficiently on, on a given die area. So that's the idea. So this is more of an economic law. There's usually discussions in terms of Moore's law. Is it, an econo is it a law of physics, law of economics, or law of psychology? Uh, and I would argue that it's a combination of both, maybe. It's, re it's really economics, the way it's stated, but uh, usually what happens is because of the competition in the semiconductor industry, people want to actually get the highest number of components so that they can actually have the uh, highest num uh, best chip in the field, uh, people, what, what people usually do is they try to push, the, push this curve as much as possible uh, to the right and push this bottom part as much as possible down. And once you have that competition, that manufacturing becomes uh, much more efficient over time. So in a sense, it's a law of psychology because people want to compete uh, and get the best circuit out. OK, so this is actually from 2000. Uh, 11, and this is from, so you can see that the curve fits still pretty well uh, compared to, to 1965, and this is from 2016. As you can see, we're almost, we're more than 20 billion now, but in 2016, it's about, about 20 billion over there. So basically, Moore's law, the ability to reduce the size of the transistor has enabled us to put many, many transistors, which means that that has translated to many, many gates, as you can see. So now you have a direct relationship between transistors and gates, so you can do many, many logic functions. Uh, so I put these numbers over here. This is 2011, and then this is 2005, because every time Moore's Law comes up, people say, oh, Moore's Law is going to end. Moore's Law has already ended, things like that. Well, clearly, the law itself, the way it's specified, isn't ending because people are putting more and more components on chip. Uh, it's become more difficult. Clearly, there's a limit at some point, because uh, once you reduce the size of the transistor, at some point, you're going to go into, like, you, maybe you cannot even pass an electron in that size, right? If you cannot pass an electron, how are you going to move charge or holes uh, in the transistor? So clearly, there's a limit at that point. But it's, not, it's probably not true that we reach that limit. Now, there's another question, which is separate from Moore's law. Moore's law says, basically, you can put many, many transistors cost efficiently on a given die area. And that's, 
that seems like that's working fine because we're putting more. And uh, unless people are losing money, they're not going to put more, right? Uh, but there's another question over here. We have these 20 billion transistors on chip. Can we actually power all of them on at the same time at the same frequency? Now, that's a different question. And that's not happening at this point in time. Basically, people are putting many, many transistors on chip, but they're not operating at the highest frequency possible because of power considerations. So circuits are power limited at this point, meaning that some of these transistors, for example, are off when they're not being operated. As a result, they're not doing useful work all the time. For example, if you have a video encoding accelerator over here and a CPU, sometimes your CPU is operating when you're not doing video. Sometimes your video encoding, decoding accelerator is operating. And one of, when one of them is operating at its peak, maybe the other is not operating at its peak. So not all of the transistors are doing equal amount of work at the highest speed. So keep that in mind. That's different from Moore's law. That's, that's how you utilize the transistors. And that's becoming much more difficult because of power constraints. And that's why power is so important. So even though we may be able to put lots of transistors on chip today, because of power constraints, we might not be able to power them up. Even if we're able to power them up, we may not be able to supply the same amount of voltage. And we may not be able to switch them as fast as possible, as you, as you saw in the dynamic uh, power equation. Because if you switch them as fast as possible, your power shoots up. And if, you're, if you are limited by the power consumption, then you have a problem. And power consumption limits are increasing. For example, we want to put these things maybe to our brains, right? If you have brain-computer interfaces, you have a much bigger problem with power over there. If you actually have, uh, you have a thermal limit over there, if you exceed that thermal limit, you may actually fire, uh, cause some issues with your brain, right? <laughs> so that, th think about it from that perspective. Okay, so I would recommend this reading. This is Moore's uh, seminal paper. It's only three pages. And there are really interesting quotes over here. Basically, he says that uh, by 1975, economics may dictate squeezing as many as 65,000 components on a single silicon chip. Today, we're at 20 billion. Interesting. But there are also some more visionary quotes over here. Will it be possible to remove the heat generated by tens of thousands of components in a single silicon chip? And this is like exactly where we are today. It's not easy uh, because we cannot power, uh, we cannot supply a lot of power to these chips. So, okay, there are a lot of issues. Basically, if you want to maintain Moore's law, we would like to do many things. This is below the level of abstraction of this course. We want to manufacture small transistors and structures. Uh, this is becoming more difficult. We want to develop materials with better properties, perhaps. Transistors are consuming a lot of power, so people are trying to develop transistors that have consume less power today. Yeah, there are different examples, which I'm not going to go into over here. Uh, and optimizing the manufacturing steps is important. This is really a manufacturing problem, and it's really one of the best manufacturing uh, technologies that we have today on Earth, in my opinion. Uh, like, how do you actually use different types of light to etch these transistors into silicon? Maybe silicon is not the best material going forward, but silicon is very common today, uh, such that you get the right circuitry and such that these things conduct well without a lot of power consumption. And these numbers are old. Today, we're much lower than 20 nanometers, actually. Okay, and then new technologies. Actually, FinFET's already employed. If you want to know about them, again, take, a micro, take an updated microelectronics design course. Uh, these are already employed in uh, many Intel's proce Intel processors. Okay, so that was an aside, but that was to give you uh, the importance of the power consumption. Uh, I'm going to close this because I can hear myself a bit. Okay, yes. So there is a... There's a finite state machine that governs the correct operation of this door. <laughs> and I, I, I simulated that finite state machine just now, basically. Okay, uh, okay, so now that was an aside. Keep that in mind. Uh, actually, I'll give you an extra credit assignment. We'll collect it via Moodle. Review Moore's paper, paper for 0.5% extra credit. It's extra credit, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it, but if you do it, you'll get 0.5%. And the course will be easier, of course, right? Okay, Juan. Moore's paper will be up. It's a bit old reading, but I think people should read these old readings. Uh, you know, if you forget history, you're doomed to repeat it. And this is a historical reading. Okay. Okay, I guess some people are already doing the extra credit assignment. That's why I hear the <laughs> sound. Okay, let's get back to combination logic. We have a lot to cover. Now we can build logic circuits. Now we really understand the workings of the basic logic gates, right? What is our next step? Basically, we want to build some logic structures that are important components of the microarchitecture of a computer. And we're going to go through that. So a logic circuit is composed of 
inputs, outputs, and two specifications, functional specification of the circuit and timing specification. Today, we're going to cover the functional specification. Next week, we're going to talk about timing. And any circuit is uh, expressed this way, an AND gate, an OR gate, an AND gate, all of them, not gate. So functional specification, what is that? This describes the relationship between inputs and outputs, just like I did for the XOR gate earlier, right? That was a functional specification. Not AND and B, or uh, AND and not B. <laughs> okay, and then timing specification describes the delay between the inputs changing and outputs responding, how much delay you get. And all circuits have delays. These are not perfect things. So there are types of logic circuits. We're going to cover combination logic. Actually, we've been covering the gates that build into combination logic. But combination logic are memoryless. They do not remember the inputs from the past. Outputs are strictly dependent on the combination of the inputs that are applied right now, not in the past. Well, clearly not into the future also. In some books, these are called combinatorial logic. Uh, and we will learn sequential logic hopefully tomorrow. Uh, this has memory. Uh, Structure stores history, and you can store data values right now. And this, with this way, you can build uh, circuits that are memory. That way, you can remember the past, and you can, you can act on the future. Right? So in this case, the outputs are determined by previous and historic, or previous meaning historical, and current values of inputs. So we'll, we'll learn sequential logic later. But now we're, we're going to focus on combination logic. So combination logic consists of Boolean equations. As we will see later, sequential logic, you can specify it in terms of Boolean equations also, but we're going to use Boolean equations to specify combinational logic. We call this functional specification. Uh, essentially, a Boolean equation is a functional specification of the circuit in terms of, uh, of the outputs in terms of inputs. So what do we mean by function? This is very similar to a mathematical function, actually. It's a unique mapping of the inputs to the output values. So input values uh, have different values, and you have a unique mapping to the output values. So the same input that you apply produces the same output value every time. So that's important. That's a deterministic function, right? Otherwise, it's not a deterministic function. And we don't have memory, as we said. Uh, basically, uh, the output values don't depend on the history of the input values. It's the input values that you're applying right now at this point. OK, let's, we'll see this adder later. But uh, how many of you studied uh, adders? Addition circuit. OK, not many. That's good. You'll learn more. This is a one-bit adder, basically. It's a binary adder. It adds binary values, one bit. One bit A, one bit B, one bit carry in. And you have combinational logic that gives you the sum of that and a carry out. If you do binary values, if A and B are 1 and the carry in is 0, you know that the sum is, what is the sum? 0, right? And then carry out is 1, because 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is, in binary, 0. And then you carry out one to the next bit. So that's essentially, you can express uh, these uh, as Boolean equations like this. So sum is actually A XOR B XOR C in. You can convince yourself, basically, at least, uh, basically, it's, it's um, uh, if you have an odd number of ones in any of these, you'll get a one in the sum. Otherwise, you'll get a zero because you're a multiple of two. And we're operating on binary, right? If you were operating on decimal, if you're a multiple of 10, your sum would be zero in the digit, and you will have a carry out of one. OK, and carry out is essentially a majority circuit, as you can see over here. Uh, and you can convince yourself also uh, of that. AB plus ACN plus BCN. OK, so this is basically the functional specification of a one-bit adder. And on top of this, you can build a four-bit adder, as we will see later on, by concatenating four one-bit adders, by connecting the carry out of the zeroth bit to the carry in of the first bit, and then carry out of the first bit to the carry in of the second bit, and then now you have a chained full adder. Okay, we'll see that later on. But this is an example functional specification. Okay, so there are simple functions clearly. Uh, not is one function, and that's a Boolean equation. It's one of the simplest Boolean equations. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but any Boolean equation is expressed like as a truth table also. This is A and B. You can see that also. This is A or B. So these are Boolean equations, clearly. And we know what, how these operate, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. So Boolean algebra is an algebra that operates on ones and zeros and was invented by George Boole. If you're interested, you can read this book. I won't give you that as an extra credit assignment. That's not relevant as much. Uh, but basically, you can operate on ones and zeros using ands or nots and more complicated things. But ands or not operations are really the basic operations. 
So we start with axioms. Axioms, if you know from mathematics, these are basic things about objects and operations that you just assume to be true at start. Uh, and then we derive laws and theorems. These allow you to manipulate Boolean expressions. And it also allows us to do simplification on Boolean expressions, which is really important. Because you may actually come up, define an adder with a very complex Boolean equation. And if you actually use uh, that Boolean equation to implement the AND or NOT gates, it'll be a huge circuit. But if you actually use these laws and theorems that I'm going to talk about to reduce the circuit, meaning reduce the equation, you may actually come up with a much simplified circuit. And that's what we're going to talk about. And the goal is to simplify the circuit as much as possible, because if you have an adder, let's say, that consists of 1,000 gates, that's probably worse than an adder that consists of 200 gates, right? You would probably pick the adder that consists of 200 gates. Of course, this is a comparison in terms of area, but area also correlates with power sometimes uh, in general. Uh, this may not correlate with latency. But we were going to minimize the circuits assuming that it's a good thing. This is not always a good thing. Or this, not always, this doesn't always satisfy your goal. Your goal may be minimizing the latency, and in that case, you may actually want a circuit that's bigger compared to a circuit that's small. OK, keep that in mind. So what do you drive later? Later, we're going to drive more sophisticated properties that are useful for manipulating digital designs represented in the form of Boolean equations. So that's a mouthful, but we'll see examples. So let's start with some axioms. Many of you are familiar with Boolean algebra, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, Boolean algebra contains at least two elements, 0 and 1, and 0 is not equal to 1. So you need to have these axioms to begin with. And then you can have a closure, basically the result of and, uh, this is and, this is or, the result that you get by doing AND and OR operation is still uh, within the set of the Boolean uh, elements, 0 or 1. So you don't get a 2, for example, because you, you operate on 0. OK, there are more interesting laws, like commutative laws. Uh, basically, A plus B is equal to B plus A. I'm going to say plus for OR and dot for AND. Uh, basically, you're going to rename the operators. And a, a, or a times b, or a dot b is equal to b dot a. So that's obvious because the input order doesn't matter. And that's true for logic gates also, right? If you have an AND gate, it doesn't matter which transistor you connect the a input and b input. If you switch the order, it's going to give you the same logical value. Identities, basically, there exists some identity elements where you, if you do the operation with the identity element, you get the uh, same input. So a plus 0 is 0. Uh, anything you end with 0 uh, uh, or with 0 is the, gives you the input. Anything you end with 1 gives you the input also. There are also distributive laws. You, basically, you can basically distribute uh, plus over dot, just like this. You can distribute dot over plus, just like this. So hopefully you've seen a lot of this. How many of you have seen this? OK, good. I'm going to go through you more quickly. So complements clearly uh, a or a bar is one. So this is logic, basically. E either A is true or A bar is true. A or A bar must be true, right? And either A or A naught. A and A naught cannot be true at the same time. As a result, you get a zero, right? OK. So duality. Have you know, do you know about duality? OK, this is fewer people. And it's always the case that this is fewer people. Basically, uh, uh, the observation is that Boole made, the, the, uh, Boole made this cool observation saying that all the axioms come in dual form. Basically, anything true for an expression is true for its dual. Uh, so any derivation you would make for the expression is true for its dual form as well. So more formally, what is duality? Basically, a dual of a Boolean expression is derived by replacing every AND operation with an OR operation, every OR operation with an AND operation, every constant 1 with a constant 0, and every constant 0 with a constant 1. And you don't change anything else. You don't change any of the literals. Literals are basically the variables. Uh, and you don't play with the complements. So let's see an example. So this is the distributed law. Uh, this is uh, the, the law that we saw. A times B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C. Now if you actually look at the dual of this, the dual of this is you basically change dot to plus and plus to dot. And that's what you get. There are no zeros and ones over here that are constant. And over here also, you do the same thing. You change the dot to plus, plus to dot, dot to plus. And essentially, this is also true. This is the other distributor law. This is n distributes over or. This is or distributes over n. So keep this duality principle. Duality principle is very useful for converting uh, one type of gates to another type of gates. 
So now actually you can actually uh, you can build different types of gates. Okay, so actually we'll see, we'll see this more. So there are more, there are more useful laws. Uh, clearly, if you get uh, if you if you or x with zero, you get x. But the dual is true also. Change plus to one, change zero to one, x and one gives you x. That's true for this other dual. You can study it yourself. Uh, x or x is x. It's either x or x, which means that it's x. <laughs> it, and if you look at the dual, x and x is also x, right? So basically, this is the idempotent law. law. And in motion is x complement complement is uh, x itself. Uh, this does, there, there exists no dual of this because it's the dual of itself. Uh, and uh, the complementarity we've seen also, again, you, you can actually do the duals over here. X or not X is one. X and not X is zero. Remember, we changed one to zero over here and plus to uh, dot. So committed all laws we have seen also. So that's, that's clear, hopefully. Okay, we're gonna see more interesting laws. This is the associated law. Uh, basically, you can associate uh, the variables differently as you can see over here. And they all X plus Y plus Z and parentheses order doesn't matter in this case. And distributed law we've already seen. So let's take a look at some simplification theorems because these are very useful in simplifying the circuits. So you have a Boolean equation that looks like this, x and y, or x and y not. Well, y, y doesn't matter in this case, right? If x and y, uh, basically you can eliminate y over here and you can get this simplifies to x, right? You can convince yourself by building the truth table or thinking about logic. And the dual of this is also true as you can see x or y and x and y bar gives you x. So this is also interesting. x or x and y evaluates to x. Uh, we're gonna prove that in a little bit. Basically you can distribute x over one plus y. Uh, uh, well, you can distribute x over one uh, and y. We'll see that, okay, in a little bit. And the dual of that is also true. So this is also another one over here. Again, I don't want to go through all of these, but uh, you can convince yourself logically again, or if you cannot convince yourself logically, do the truth table. And once you do the truth table, you will see that these functions are equal, right? So this is actually worth remembering. This happens a lot in circuits. Somehow, somehow you end up in situations like this. You get an X input and you get X anded with Y, uh, and then you, you, you need to simplify it. It's very easy. Get rid of the AND gate that has X and X added with Y. Okay, so let's take a look at proving theorems a little bit. Uh, so this is the previous uh, theorem, simplification theorem. Uh, so we have the x dot y and x plus x dot y bar. Uh, let's take a look at how we obtain x. Basically, we distribute x over y plus y bar. That's the distributed law. And y plus y bar, either y is true or y bar is true, which means that this must be true. That's one. And then x times one is one. x and one is one. Uh, sorry, x and one is x, and then you get x in the end. That's how you get x over here. So this is the common gates that I said over here. Uh, give me the, a second and I'll finish this. Uh, basically, this is x plus x times y. Uh, how do we get x over here? x means x times one, or x and one, and this is x and y. Now, if you write it this way, you can distribute x over one plus y, and one plus y is one because anything you or with one is one and then x and one is x in the end. So that's how we get x, yes? Um, does and find stronger than or, such that we can leave out the parentheses? I mean, yeah, so exactly, yes, exactly. So there is an ordering, uh, that's a implicit ordering that I assumed over here. So I, I've left out the parentheses over here. Uh, so x dot y is evaluated first plus x dot, uh, this, this is uh, evaluated first also. That's a very good point. So I'm going to make a comment later on when we talk about hardware description languages. Uh, actually, I normally don't do that, but in this case for readability, <laughs> I tried to do it. Okay, so though hopefully these are simple. Have you done this kind of sort of proofs in the past, discrete math? Okay. Okay, how about De Morgan's laws? You know about these? Okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly also. Basically, uh, De Morgan's law is essentially this. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a logical description. This is really a transformation of a circuit. We're gonna talk about why it's important in terms of circuits. So let's assume we have F equals A plus B plus C, A or B or C. Applying the Morgan's law over here gives us this, basically. Uh, so basically this is complement of complement of A or B or C is uh, not A and not B and not C and complement of that. Now you can actually convert 
these gates to these gates. So logically, the Morgan's law is it's good, it is to think of it that way. At least one of A or B or C must be true for this function to be true. Logically, this means that it's not the case that A and B and C are all false. That's how you get to this. Logically, that's it. Now, why is it interesting for us? Uh, so basically, these are conversion between different types of logic functions. They can prove useful if you do not have any type of gate, or if one gate is faster than another. So this is an example. NOR is equivalent to AND with inputs complemented. This is a NOR gate. This is an AND with inputs complemented. For some reason, this is faster than this. You can switch between different gates. Right? Or for some reason, you don't have this gate, whatever reason. Or you don't want to have that gate because it's costly in terms of area. That's true over here also. This is an AND. NAND is equivalent to OR with the inputs complemented over here. So you can switch between different gates. Uh, and you will see in your book, if you do your readings, uh, the book claims that in some cases, NOR is much faster than NAND. So if, if that's the case, and if you want to build a circuit out of fast components, you want to build everything out of NORs, and you want to, com you want to essentially convert everything into NORs, right? OK, so that's why the Morgan's laws are very useful. They enable you to transform one circuit to another circuit. OK, uh, so we're going to use Boolean equations to rec represent a circuit, a logic circuit, more methodically right now. Uh, let's take a look at that. So we're going to develop sum of products forms. I actually gave you that example with XOR very early. The key idea over here is assume we have a truth table of a Boolean function. We want to express uh, the Boolean function in terms of inputs in a very standard manner. The idea is sum of products form. You express the truth table as a two-level Boolean expression. Do you, do you know about this, sum of products forms? OK, not. Uh, so you need, uh, this is a Boolean expression that contains all input variable combinations that result in a one output. If any of the combinations of the input variables that results in a one output is true, then the output is one. Basically, you look at the truth table in the output. You look at all the cases where the output is one. And you look at all the combinations that lead to the one output. And you basically uh, 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 enumerate all those combinations in terms of literals. And then you OR those variable combinations uh, that result in a 1. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Let me define some things first. Complement, you know, this is a variable with a bar over it. Literal is a variable OR, it's complement. You will see this in the uh, textbook also. Implicant is a product of AND of literals, so A bar C. Min term, this is important. This is basically the product that includes all input variables. We're going to, we, we want to have a standard form of uh, uh, functions, so we, we're, ex we're going to express every function with its min terms, which uh, basically you, we want to have the product that includes all input variables. So a, uh, let's assume that a function has three inputs. This is one example, a and b and c bar. If this gives you a one, that's going to be part of your uh, sum of products form. Okay, max term, we're going to get back to this, but think about this as uh, uh, the sum that includes all input variables. That's the OR that inputs all, uh, includes all input variables. So let's look at the standard form first. So uh, we're going to go over the break a little bit, and then I'm going to give you a break. So truth table is a unique signature of any Boolean function. We knew this. It's an expressive representation. And a Boolean function can have many, many uh, Boolean expressions. But we don't want many. We want the actually a standard form. Uh, so this is the canonical form. It's a standard form for a Boolean expression. Uh, it provides a unique algebraic signature, but why do we want to do this? Basically, uh, different Boolean expressions lead to different gate realization. We want a standard form to begin with, and then we're going to minimize that standard form, as you will see in this lecture. So how do we form the standard form? This is sum of products form. It's called so-called the disjunctive normal form, or min term expansion. First of all, we find all the input combinations, or min terms, for which the output of the function is true. So if you look at the truth table, these are the five input combinations for which the output is true. Now we're going to enumerate all of them. This one is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. OK, if the inputs take these values, then the output will be true, which means that we're going to express them as min terms. So if A bar, B, and C is true, the output is 1. If A, B bar, C bar is true, the output is 1, dot, dot, dot. So if any of these are true, which means that you OR them, then the output is true. So that's simple. Basically, I've given you the sum of products form for this truth table function over here. Each row in the truth table has a min term over here, and this is a min term for here, min term for here. And then a min term is a product of literals. Literal is A bar, A and uh, basically a variable and its complement. 
An H mean term is true for that row and only for that row. And all Boolean equations can be written in this sum of products form. That's beautiful, right? So you can actually write all Boolean equations. So why does it work? Uh, clearly, if you, let's say, pick one input, it activates this term, and then you get a one over here. So if you pick any inputs over here that lead to a one, this should lead to a one over here. So you can actually, change, uh, you can actually test whether you form the sum of products form correctly. So no other products terms, uh, terms will turn on because you're really specifying the input variables completely with, uh, with these min terms over here. Okay, so I'm going to go through this quickly. So if inputs A, B, C do not correspond to any product term in the expression, then you get a zero at the end. So for example, uh, let's take the input zero, zero, zero. If you take the input zero, 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 none of these will become one because you constructed these such that uh, they will become one only if the output is one, only if the input variable such that they will lead to an output of one. Right? So that's the idea over here. So this is a canonical form. Let me finish the shorthand notation and then we're going to uh, take a break. So basically, now you can agree on this uh, order of variables in the rows of the truth table. Now you can enumerate uh, essentially each row with the decimal number that corresponds to the binary number that correspond, that's created by the input pattern. So for example, we have these three input function. You have eight rows over here. This is min term zero, min term one, and then you go all the way to min term eight. So this is, let's say, input combination is one, zero, zero. It's decimal four, this is min term four. This is decimal seven, so it's min term seven. Now you can express this function as a three input function, sum of products of min terms, min term three, four, five, six, seven, because only in those min terms this, uh, this function evaluates to one, right? Or you can use a summation notation like this. Now this is, we're going to, uh, this is the basis of automation actually, because now we can express any function that has a truth table this way, and you can automate all of this, right? And then we're gonna see how we can actually minimize this. So this is uh, basically, again, any three input function looks like this, and that's a shorthand notation. And in canonical form, you get the sum of min terms three, four, five, six, seven over here. Okay, let's do the minimization over here a little bit and then uh, I'll, I'll give you some time. And then if somebody expresses this function to you this way, now I can take it and minimize it, right? So canonical form is not the same as minimal form. This is actually a maximal form if you think about it. It's not the uh, wasteful maximal form. It's the maximal form that contains all the input variables uh, combinations. You can of course make it even have, it have an even maximal form by adding more variables over here that you can eliminate right, later on. So you can always add B plus B bar over here and then they eliminate each other, right? Uh, but this is a meaningful maximal form, canonical form. It's not minimal form. So we want to figure out how we actually minimize this. And I'm gonna give you examples of this later on. But one way of minimizing the circuit is actually apply the laws that we've discussed. You basically somehow magically figure out by observation uh, you take out a b bar and then you get c or c bar, that's one over here, and then you take out a b from here and you get c or c bar, and then this is one, this is one, and then the circuit becomes minimized a little bit, and then you realize that a b bar or a b can be simplified also, and then you get a or a bar b c, now you have a simple, and then you can also simplify this as well in the end, okay? Okay, so this is really the two level and or realization. We'll later see, uh, but if you, if you actually build this one, that's a much bigger circuit, right? It actually has uh, five, three input uh, and gates, and one, one, two, three, four input or gate. Right? So it's actually a much bigger circuit. You can minimize it this way. How do you minimize it this way? Once you get the min terms, you apply the Boolean equations, but I will show you a cool method that is used by synthesis tools that do this automatically later on. Uh, okay, basically, you get, you, this leads to two-level logic, as you can see over here. Uh, you get, uh, this is the uh, two-level logic uh, description uh, of the sum of products form. This is one thing you can build. If you have the sum of products form, you can directly build this. Basically, you get, you get all the min terms over here. This is uh, A bar, B bar, C bar over here. This is another function. Or uh, the second min term over here or the third min term, right? But this is a maximal circuit. You don't want this, you want to minimize it somehow. Okay, let's stop here. I'll start with this alternative canonical form. Uh, I'll give you 10 minutes. We have a lot to cover. Let's be back when the uh, bell rings. Okay, let's, let's continue where we left off. Uh, 
think you, you, some of you had a lot of nice questions during the break, so keep them coming. Uh, but now we're a little bit behind schedule. So remember, uh, we talked about the sum of products form, this is a canonical form. You can express any circuit this way. There is another form, which is the product of sums form, which in my opinion is not as intuitive. Sum of products form is intuitive because you look at the truth table, you look at the cases where the output value is one, and then you basically uh, combine the input variable combinations or the input variable combinations that lead to ones. It's very intuitive in the sense that if this input variable combination leads to one, the function leads to one. And then you basically or all of those input variable combinations that lead to one. So product of sums form is kind of exactly the opposite. If this input variable combination leads to zero, then the function must evaluate to zero. And you enumerate all the possible input combinations that lead to zero as a sum form, as a product of sums form, meaning end of those input variable combinations that lead to zero. That's the idea. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Uh, it's or another way of thinking about it is sum of uh, product of sums form is the De Morgan of the sum of product form of F bar. You will see what that is. <laughs> Basically, it's a product of sums. You basically start with the zero values. Before we start with the one values for the sum of products, we'll start with the zero output values. And then we're going to enumerate them as sums. So this function is zero. If a is zero, b is zero, c is zero. If this value is zero. Uh, and this, this function is zero if this uh, is zero. And if this function is zero if this is zero. So you basically combine these sums. And then that's what you get. So if any of these is zero, you get a zero on the out. Each sum term represents one of the zeros of the function, zero outputs. So that's what you get. This is how you express f, basically. So it's very similar to what we've seen. It's the other way around, basically. OK, so hopefully you can convince yourself that that's the case. For example, uh, we have this term a plus b bar plus c over here. That's activated. Activated means that this is a term uh, that gets activated. This is also called the max term. Uh, that gets activated uh, if the inputs are 0, 1, 0. You see that if this is 0, 1, 0, you get a 0 over here. Uh, and the function evaluates to 0. OK, so this input activates this term, and you get a 0. For the given input, only the shaded sum term will equal 0. If, this is, if the input is 0, 1, 0, this is 1. This is also 1. right? But this one's zero. As a result, you get a zero on the output. So they're basically uh, independent of each other. Well, that's, that's the nature of the thing, because we're enumerating all of the input variables, uh, as you can see, in each of the terms over here. So these are called max terms now, not the min terms like, like we've discussed earlier. They're like max terms. And uh, as you know, anything added with zero is zero. As a result, output of f will be zero. OK, let's, uh, we're, we're, we can evaluate another case over here. This is the uh, product of sums form of this function. If you give this input, 0, 1, 0, uh, you basically evaluate all of those and then do uh, ORs, of, ors of them. You get 1, 1 here and 0 over here, and then end leaves you 0. OK, so hopefully that's obvious right now. So how do you write product of sums? Uh, essentially, these are the max terms. You find the truth table rows where f is 0, and then uh, if there's a zero in the input column, that's a true literal. So zero ex is expressed as a, not a bar. That's different from this one over here. Uh, and if you have a one in the input column, that you have a, you have a complement literal. So in this case, one is expressed as c bar over here, as you can see. And you or the literals to get the max term. So max term corresponds to this row in the truth table, a or b or c. And then you end together all the max terms to get the product of sums form. OK, that's exactly what we did. Or you don't do any of that. <laughs> you figure out the sum of products form. And remember this. Product of sums of f is the same as the Morgan of su sum of products of f bar. That's another way of getting the sum of product form. Because these are different ways of specifying the functions, whether you encode the zero outputs or whether you encode the uh, one outputs. OK, similarly, you can express these max terms. You can basically express a function uh, with its, all of its max terms. So this is the max term notation. It's a large M as opposed to a small M. And this M6, large M6, means that max term 6 is active in this function. And if you actually want to uh, specify this function that we've seen earlier, uh, it's basically a product of max terms 0, 1, 2. 
and this is this function. If, you, if, if somebody gives you this function, you know that the truth table corresponds to this. Assuming, you know, of course, they also need to tell you how many inputs there are. In this case, there are three inputs. Okay, I think I've already said this. Uh, okay, this is important. Uh, we already said that. This is not the complement of the function. This is the function itself. If you want the complement of the function, basically you need to complement uh, of this. And we're gonna see that uh, also. You can express it in a different way. Okay, so there are some useful conversions. I don't know if I want to go into all of these over here, but basically uh, you can convert min term to max terms. You rewrite the min term shorthand using the max term shorthand. I'll give you examples actually, examples are easier. Basically, if you have a function that's specified, three input function that's specified with these min terms, product of sums form is exactly this basically, max term zero, one, two. It's the complement uh, of uh, it, but it's not, the, it's the same function again, right? Okay. Uh, basically use the remaining indices uh, that you haven't used in the min term version. So a max term to min term is the same, the other way around basically. Uh, if you know this, if the function is written as product of sums of max term zero, one, two, you know that the function is also the sum of products of min terms three, four, five, six, seven. You can expand f to f bar this way. If the function is this way, the complement of it is the uh, sum of products of uh, the terms that don't exist over here, basically. So that's cool. Uh, now, now actually you can give this to a, a synthesis tool and it can do all of these conversions, right? Uh, if it wants. And the, the same is true over here. If a function has a product of sums form that looks like this, the complement must have the product of sums forms, uh, some form with, uh, uh, with the input variable combinations, the max terms that are not present over here. Okay, so you can, uh, you can do min term expansion uh, of f to max term expansion of x prime. I'm going to skip this. You can do this uh, on your own, basically. You can do these very, uh, uh, clearly you can do this algebra, uh, take it much further. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. Before we go into minimizing circuits, we're going to look into some useful building blocks because I think this is really important to cover. Uh, I don't wanna make this lecture really dull covering all of the simplification circuits. Actually. Uh, normally you take a logic design course and you go into a lot of detail into how these tools operate, but we're not gonna do that uh, clearly. So, but just, just think that there are courses actually that talk about just how to minimize functions and how to actually build these synthesis tools. I'm gonna get back to simplification a little bit, but let's take a look at some of these useful combinational building blocks. So basically we, we've seen some gates, but often you want to group these gates into larger building blocks to build more complex systems. This hides unnecessarily gate level details uh, to emphasize the function of the building block. So we're gonna look at four of these things. Decoders, multiplexers, full adder, programmable logic arrays. Has anyone know, uh, learned about decoders before? Okay, not that many, that's good. If you did your readings, then you would learn about it. So it's in your readings. So please do your readings. So a decoder is basically, <laughs> I, uh, a decoder is a pattern detector. Think of it this way. You basically have N inputs, and two to the n outputs. And you basically decode those n input signal. Okay, what does this mean? It takes n inputs and exactly one of the outputs is one and all the rest are zeros. It tells you, it basically uniquely identifies the input with one of the outputs. That's the idea. Pattern detector. Okay, so basically this is an example decoder. Very simple, it decodes a two input value, a, b, if A and B are zero, uh, both zeros, this is one and everything else is zero. If A and B are zero, one, this is one and all of the other outputs are zero. So these are the four outputs over here. If A is one, B is zero, this is one and everything else is zero. If A and B are both ones, this is one and everything else is zero. So now you uniquely identified what your input pattern is. So I like calling this a pattern matcher. Uh, the one output that is logically one is the output corresponding to the input pattern that the logic circuit is expected to detect. You're really detecting what A and B are and uh, making the uh, corresponding output line a one. Okay, so clearly we've done some simulation over here. And you can build a truth table for this and that's what you get. So this is a two input, four output circuit, as you can see. So why is this useful? It's useful in determining how to interpret a bit pattern and this is commonly encountered in systems. So you've seen the DRAM early, in earlier lectures, right? 
you want to address a row, you want to access a row in memory, and we will see this more when we talk about sequential circuits. Basically, this A and B, or the input pattern, could be the address of a row that you want to read from. How do you identify that row? Well, let's assume that you have four rows. You specify the addresses of four rows with two bits, and these two bits activate uh, the line that is connected to that row. In this case, if you've specified row one zero, and you're trying to read from row one zero over here, and that's the word line that's activated, and we will see this in memories. So it's very common in memories. Or it could be an instruction in the program, and the processor has to decide what action to do based on the instruction opcode. We will understand this later. Opcode is opcode specifies what the instruction is supposed to do. Every instruction is encoded with some bit pattern. So let's say add is encoded with one zero. And uh, basically you get this instruction and the decoder is trying to decode and basically raises this line over here and this line says, oh, it's an add instruction. So do something based on this line and do the addition. Okay, yes? Uh, would there be one centralized hub basically where all the uh, instructions go together and then there is a huge decoder for the yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you will see, you'll see that uh, uh, in, in the later lectures. When you're decoding, usually uh, it's, it's somewhat centralized if you're decoding the opcodes. So you, you, build, you have something similar to this, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. You're thinking ahead, which is good. <laughs> okay, so this, these are some real examples. So that's why this decoder is very useful. You will see that. It's a pattern matcher. It tries to, you, you want to understand what's the pattern in the address and what is the pattern in the opcode. Okay, multiplexer has similarities to the decoder, but it's really a selector. It selects one of the N inputs to connect to the output. So basically, I'll give you an example of this. Basically, uh, uh, you have N inputs, and you want to select only one of them. Let's say you have two inputs, you want to select one of them. How do you do that? So it needs a log to the N bit control input. So this is a selector uh, that has a select line, it selects either A or B. If select line is zero, C becomes A. If select line is one, C becomes B. Basically, depending on the select line, you either choose a left input or input at the zero point or uh, the one input over here. Make sense? So this is an example. If the select line is zero, a passes over here, because this is zero, you get zero. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So why is this useful? Because you want to select things. The output C is always connected to either the input A or the input B. Output value depends on the value on the select line S. So we actually uh, show this as, like this. So this could be any number of bits, if you will. So the select line selects A or B. And this is usually denoted as zero or one. So if the select line is zero, you get zero or one. Uh, okay, so you, if you want to, for example, uh, select between some value or some other value to add later on, that's how you do it. And this is the truth table. This is an interesting truth table. Basically, if select line is zero, you choose A. If select line is one, you choose B. Now your task, this is for your fun, this is easy to do. You could draw the schematic for an eight input mux, eight to one mux. You can do this in multiple ways. One way is doing it at the gate level as a combination of basic and or not gates, which is going to be basically expansion of this, and it's going to be easy, actually. Uh, or you could raise the abstraction level a little bit. You could do this at the module level. Basically, you could start with uh, two uh, input muxes. Let's, this is a two input mux, and then you combine them. I'll, let, I'll leave that up to you. It's, it, that's also easy to do. Uh, basically, you'll need to put, put these muxes together. Okay, so let's talk about full adder. This is a bit more interesting, maybe. Although the, the, the other ones we're going to use all the time. Uh, binary addition, as I told you earlier, uh, we, we have circuits for this. Binary addition is similar to decimal addition. Uh, you go from right to left. Uh, you do one column at a time. You have one sum and one carry bit. We talked about this earlier in this lecture. So you basically uh, add A and B, and you get a sum bit, and you get a carry out. And this is the carry out that's produced by addition over here. And then you add A, B, carry out, you get a sum bit, and you get another carry out for the next uh, bit over here. So it's really uh, um, a serial uh, way of doing addition. 
So if you want to form the truth table of binary addition of just one column over here, assume that there's a carry bit uh, with two n bit operands, this is what you get basically. This is uh, a, b, carry, each of them is one bit, and you get a carry out, and you get the sum. And you can convince yourself this is true. Assuming that's true, uh, basically, by, uh, you can, uh, basically you can express this as a sum of products of one bit addition, right? So you can build this circuit. This is a sum of products form of the carry out and sum. And again, you can convince yourself by going through what we just did with the sum of products form, right? Basically, uh, carry out uh, is true for these four input combinations. And then you figure out what those four input combinations are and then connect them to the carry out over here. And then sum is also true for these four input combinations over here. And then you figure out what those are and connect them to this OR gate and that's your sum. And this is the sum of products form built into a circuit, logic level circuit. It's not the minimal form of the one bit adder, but it's a beautiful canonical form. Okay, we'll call this full adder. We're gonna ignore what happens inside. We're gonna specify it. Uh, now we have, we're gonna build four bit adders from, uh, a four bit adder from it. It's not that hard. Basically, if you want to build a four bit adder from four one bit full adders, this is what you do. This is the zeroth bit. Clearly, there's no carry in. You just have A and B, so a carry in is zero, and you get the sum, and then connect the carry out to the carry in of the next bit. Same thing, this is uh, bits, one, bits one for both A and B, and then connect the carry out of this to the carry in of the next bit, and then you keep doing the same thing. And if you want to build a 32-bit adder, you do the same thing. Clearly, this may be slow because now you, this carry in, uh, how, long, how long it takes to produce this carry in determines the speed of how fast you can produce the bit that's out here, right? Which is, in this case, a bit, uh, bit four over here, or bit three over here. Okay. So, but we built a full adder right now. By abstracting a single one bit adder, now we have a full adder, and this is just for fun. There's no, there's no interesting thing over here. You can do the addition, binary addition yourselves, hopefully. Okay, so that's the adder. Now let's talk about one more thing, programmable logic array. This is a programmable, uh, configurable uh, thing, actually. It could be configurable, but it's definitely programmable. So basically, programmable logic array is something interesting. It's a structure uh, that's a common building block that enables you to implement any logic function that one wishes to. At least in this case, uh, you have uh, a three input and a three output logic function. Why? Because this kind of looks like the sum of products form, right? It is actually the sum of products form. It basically has all the input combinations over here and three possible outputs. And you can, there are connections over here that are programmable that allow you to connect any of these over here to any of the inputs over here. Which means that you can pick any of the min terms, these are actually min terms over here, and connect them to any of the outputs in any combination, and then you can connect any function that is of three inputs and three outputs. That's the idea. So programmable logic array is a programmable structure that can enable you to implement uh, the sum of products form, which means that you can implement any function. It's an array of AND gates, that give you the min terms, followed by an array of OR gates that give you the ORing of the min terms that you want. So how do you determine the number of AND gates? Remember the sum of product form, the number of possible min terms. For an N input logic function, you need two to the N to imp N input N gates, because you have two to the N uh, lines in the truth table, right? Two to the N possible combinations for N, input N inputs. How do you determine the number of OR gates? Well, this is the number of outputs in your truth, truth table. So if your truth table has one output, and if you have this circuit, these are useless basically. You don't connect them anywhere, but you use this one. So this conne these connections actually can be programmable. Fundamentally, at some level, FPGAs work this way. It's, they don't exactly consist of PLAs because PLA is actually a, a not minimal way of specifying things, but you can actually program these connections. Okay, yes? So that depends on uh, basically the circuit. It could be arbitrary, but uh, if, you, if you want to implement a 10 input function, you should, a 10 output function, you need to uh, have a PLA that's able to give you 10 outputs. Although four to two to the power of n outputs doesn't make sense. Uh, more than what? More than two to the power of n outputs. Yeah, exactly. Some of them are redundant probably in that case, exactly. But that's a lot of outputs to the end, right? <laughs> 
Okay, any questions? Okay, uh, so I've already given you the program of logic array. Uh, so how do we implement a logic function? You connect the output of an AND gate to the input of an OR gate if the corresponding min term is included in the SOP, as we've seen earlier. It's simple programmable logic. Uh, logic. Uh, so you pro uh, you, we call this programming the connections from the AND gate outputs to the OR gate inputs to implement a desired logic function. And we've seen other type of programmable logic and FPGA. FPGA uses similar structures, but not exactly the same today. But you can think of this as, uh, um, as a programmable circuitry. Okay, let's implement a full adder using a PLA. Uh, basically, P uh, an adder has uh, three inputs uh, and three outputs. Well, let's assume that we have this PLA that has three inputs and three outputs, but we're not gonna use three outputs in a full adder, clearly, right? The truth table of a full adder is you have two outputs over here uh, and three inputs. And basically, sum of products form says that min terms these min terms, uh, I guess you want to three, five, six, seven, should be connected to carry out. So you figure out three, five, six, seven, and connect them to the carry out. And then for, to, for the sum function, you basically pick these min terms and connect them to the sum. And that's it, basically. <laughs> Sounds simple, right? <laughs> okay. So clearly, in this case, I didn't show you all possible connections over here. If you look at a PLA, it consists of basically uh, all possible eight combinations getting connected to all possible outputs over here, but so that uh, I can simplify the picture over here, I showed you the connected uh, things over here. So how do you connect and disconnect? That's the function of what we're going to discuss in a little bit. Okay, so clearly this input should not be connected to any outputs because that min term doesn't exist in any of the outputs over here, and clearly you do not need this output because the outputs, there are only two outputs over here. Okay, well, you know about logical completeness. We talked about that before. Basically, any logic function we wish to implement can be implemented with this PLA that I showed you, assuming the inputs and outputs uh, are enough. Uh, cons it consists of AND gates, OR gates, and inverters. Well, where are the inverters? Inverters are here, as you can see, uh, the, the bubbles over there. And you just need to program the connections based on the sum of products of the intended logic function, which means that uh, the set of gates, and or not, is logically complete because you can build a circuit uh, uh, that carries out the specification of any truth table using just and or not. So NAND is also logically complete, as we've discussed last time. NOR is also logically complete. I'm not going to prove this. Your task is to prove this. Maybe you've already proven this. Have you proven this in the past? Okay, no. It's not that important to prove it, but you can convince yourself for it. So more on combinational building blocks. Uh, these are the readings, and I would recommend you. Basically, chapter two in full. I've covered actually a lot of chapter two right now. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit more because this is really important. Uh, and then this will be a required reading soon. You don't need to do it yet. And you will benefit greatly by reading the combinational uh, chapter, uh, parts of chapter five soon. So let's talk about one other logic element, which is interesting, uh, which is a bit different from what we've seen so far. It's called a tri-state buffer. Has anyone seen this before? Tri-state buffers? Okay, some, some of you have. Interesting. Uh, basically, this is an enabler. It enables the gating uh, of different signals onto a wire, whether the wire should be connected to this other wire or not. That's the idea. So it looks like this logically. Uh, it has an enable input. If the enable input is one, then essentially this acts like a wire. Y gets connected to A. If the enable input is zero, Y doesn't get connected to A and we denote that as y is equal to z, z value. It's called a floating value. Basically, the wire is floating because it's not driven by any circuit over here. That's the idea. Signal that's not driven by any circuit, that's called a floating signal. It's also called an open circuit or a floating wire or high z value uh, or high impedance value. You can see this. So this is actually very useful in designing building blocks as we will see later on. Uh, why is it useful? Because there may be some cases where you may not want to drive this wire with this output. This output could be the output of any combinational circuit over here, right? But you may not want to put that on this wire. Why? Because somebody else may want to put something on that wire, right? So that's the idea over here. So basically imagine, I'll give you one example. Imagine a wire connecting the CPU and the memory. And that's shared by, between the CPU and the memory. At any time, uh, only the CPU or the memory can place a value on the wire, but not both because either the CPU is transmitting a value to the memory or the memory is transmitting a value to the CPU. Now you can use that wire 
and connects two tri-state buffers to it. One is driven by the CPU and the other is driven by the memory and ensure at most one of them is enabled at any time. And this is the picture, basically. This is a huge logical building block picture. CPU consists of many combinational and sequential circuits. It has something that's maybe something that's driving over here. Only when it's supposed to transfer something to memory, I didn't complete it over here, then basically it can load stuff to the shared bus and you set gate CPU to one and gate mem to zero. So you don't uh, load values from both of them at the same time to the bar, uh, bus over here. And if the memory wants to send something, put something on the shared bus, then you set gate mem, the enable signal of this tri-state buffer to one and the enable signal of this one to zero, that ensures that only memory drives this wire. Now if you for some reason make a mistake and put enable both of the tri-state buffers, yeah, we're in trouble. Which means that both of these uh, circuits will be driving this wire and you'll get an undefined value called X in the end. It's undefined value because you don't know what's, ha what's going to happen over there, right? Uh, in fact, you, you might fry your circuits uh, depending on how these things interact. If no one is transmitting, it's okay for this to be floating. So if gate CPU is zero, not enabled, not enabled, there's no value on the bus, which means that there is no transmission that's happening. It's okay for that value to be floating. So floating values are not bad. Z is not bad. Z is used for ensuring things are connected appropriately during transmission. X is bad. If you're actually overloading your circuit, it's actually bad. Okay, so now we've covered a lot. Let's cover a little bit more. Has anybody heard about Carnot maps? Okay, some of you, interesting. So we will learn more about that. Now we're gonna go into more logic simplification. Okay, I don't know why that happened that way. So we're gonna minimize things using Carnot maps. This is gonna be fun. This is gonna be the base of uh, some motivated tools. So this is our adder. This is the sum of products form implemented in circuit. A lot of gates, a lot of connections. In fact, uh, if you want to implement an eight input XOR circuit in sum of products form, you're in trouble. Do this exercise for yourself, and eight input XOR is two to the eight. Uh, uh, it's two to the eight uh, uh, input combinations, right? That's 64. Uh, no, that's 128. I can do this. I can, I'm sure I can do this. That's 256, sorry. Okay, 256, that's much better. Uh, so you have basically 256 over here, and in the end, uh, you actually have a huge OR gate uh, for the output. So eight input XOR, XOR is actually a really bad circuit to implement in some of products form because it really gives you an output of one uh, if an odd number of uh, the inputs are one, right? Okay, but this is full adder, this is actually even simpler. Uh, okay, now we want to simplify it somehow. Actually, if you simplify it, it turns out uh, the sum is A XOR B XOR C in, and the output is basically AB plus AC plus BC, which is really the bitwise majority uh, of ABC. That's actually a majority function. So how do we simplify uh, to get from the sum of products to this Boolean uh, this, uh, these equations over here? So let's talk about logic simplification. Clearly, or, or original Boolean expression may not be optimal. This is one example that's cooked up, which is terrible actually. Uh, the question is, can we reduce a Boolean expression to uh, get to an equivalent expression with fewer terms, and the idea is we can, and you can convince yourself this is A plus B. The goal is to reduce the number of gates and inputs, reduce the implementation cost. Not necessarily reduce the latency, but hopefully when you have a smaller circuit, you can understand it better and optimize it better also. So it's really the basis for the automated design tools that we're using today. Actually, today there's a lot of computer-aided design, electronic design automation that uses what we're going to discuss. And the key tool that they use is what is called the unifying theorem, or uniting theorem. Uh, basically, uh, they're systematic techniques for systematic, uh, simplifications, and they're amenable to automation. So what is uniting the theorem? We've actually seen this before. Uh, basically, if you look over here, uh, that's, that's basically this. Uh, if, if a function looks like this, a B bar plus A B, you can simplify it as A, right? Basically, what happens is if you look at that function, B's value changes within the rows where F is equal to one over here, B's value changes, but A's value doesn't change, which means that the output of the function is independent of the B's values, but it's dependent on A's value. So this is also called onset. Onset is the uh, rows where the function's output is equal to one. 
So A's value does not change with the onset rows, which means that an input can change without changing the output. What does that mean? That input value is useless for determining the output value. So B is eliminated, A remains. So I'm showing this to you because we're going to move to a pictorial representation a little bit. So you can also get this from here. Okay, that's, that's, the pro, uh, that's, a th uh, that's essentially you can actually simplify this equation for using equations. So that's another example. Uh, this function g over here, b's value stays the same, a's value changes for the cases where the inputs are one, uh, where the output is one, which means that uh, the function g is independent of uh, uh, a's value because a's value changes, whereas b's value stays the same. a is eliminated, b remains over here. And you can convince yourself also. And that's the equation over here. So the essence of simplification is that we want to find two elements that are subsets of this onset, onset meaning where the function evaluates to true, uh, where only one variable changes its value, and that single varying variable can be eliminated because the function is independent of that variable for those particular input sets, uh, for those particular input combinations that lead to one. So the, the difficulty is clearly you can do this, right? This, these are logic equations, but it becomes complex as, you, as the circuits become, com become complex. So this is a little bit more complex, so you can clearly easy to see how you apply the uniting theorem. You figure out where this happens, right? Yeah. For example, you look at A, B bar C and A, B, C. You can simplify to A, C because B's value changes and clearly you're independent of B's value. But it's hard to know if you applied it all in the right places. Basically, especially in a function with many, many more variables. Think about it, I don't know, 2,000 input function. Uh, the question is, is there an easier way to find potential simplifications or potential application of the uniting theorem? And the answer is yes, uh, and I'm going to give you an, a geometric representation of Boolean function that's later used for other representations that we're not going to talk about. This, but this is fun because it's really a pictorial way of thinking about it. So a Carnot map method, uh, it's an alternative method for representing the truth table. Essentially, we're going to represent the truth table pictorially. Well, it was pictorial before, but it's, we're going to represent it alternatively so that we can visualize adjacencies in up to six dimensions. We're not going to go to six dimensions because I cannot think in six dimensions. I can think in maybe a few. Uh, so physical adjacency here in the truth table will be the same as logical adjacency. Remember, in the uniting theorem, things are logically adjacent. A, B bar plus A, B equals to A. Uh, because you can see the uh, AB bar and AB are logically adjacent to each other. So let's take a look at, uh, this, is, uh, if, um, this is what the K map looks like. Basically, this is a function that consists of two inputs, uh, and these are the two, uh, four different cases of those two inputs. Uh, and you can see that they're like this. This is a three-variable K map, a function that consists of three inputs, A is zero or one, or, and BC is zero, 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 one, 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 zero. And this is a function that consists of four inputs. A, B can take these values, C, D can take these values. Now, what's interesting about this? So we've actually numbered these things very carefully, especially if, you, let's take a look at over, actually, let's take a look over here. So if you look over here, uh, only when you go from left to right, only one of the variables changes, which means that physically adjacent things are logically adjacent also. Only a single bit changes from one code word to the next code word over here. That's true over here also, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Only one variable changes. Here, A is zero, B changes. Here, B is one, A changes. And here, A is one, and B changes, right? Which means that if you have a case where this is one and this is one, and you know that the function evaluates to one in both cases, you can easily eliminate A. Uh, you can easily eliminate B, right? Because the function is one independent of B's value, but the function is uh, dependent on A's value, which is one. So we're gonna use that physical adjacency, uh, which is also telling us a logical adjacency to actually simplify the function. Now let's take a look at some examples over here. So basically adjacency is true in the uh, wraparound space also. So if you look over here, uh, this part over here, A, B, C is all zeros over here. In this case, A is zero, B is one, C is zero, which means that these are also adjacent to each other. Only one variable changes over here, right? That's true over here also. Uh, if you look over here, this is A is zero, one zero, but that's one, one zero, that's, that's easy to uh, guess. Basically, adjacent go around the edges, you wrap around from the first column to the last column, and you wrap around from the top row to the bottom row. Okay, 
So let's take a look at this function and let's simplify it using the kmap method. This is a function that has four input variables, and these are the cases where it's a one. So now clearly you can form the sum of products form of this. You can basically figure out all of the cases where this is one, and then write all input variable combinations and or them. That's a lot of ones, right? We could do it, and that's it basically. But now let's try to simplify it just by looking at the kmap without actually building the equations. So what do you do? What do you do? You first start with the largest possible circle of ones. That is a power of two. So in this case, you see a lot of ones over here. Now, what does that evaluate? Well, I've already given you the answer, I guess. <laughs> so if you look over here, the value is independent of CD, right? Because it doesn't matter what the value, uh, if you look over here, all of them, uh, it doesn't matter what the value of CD is, the function evaluates the one over here. Also, it doesn't matter what the value of B is, the function evaluates the one over here, which is the value of A. So basically, this is A. If you circle them, this gives you the function is true if A is true. Okay? You can convince yourself if you think about that a little bit, because these values are one independently of the values of C and D, because of all of these adjacencies, you say, okay, I don't care what the values of C and D are, the function value is to one. I don't care what the value of B is, the function value is to one. Well, the function is really A over here. Okay, now let's take a look at the other. Uh, and then the next step is finding the next big uh, uh, circle of adjacencies. And this is a harder one. This is actually where a lot of people miss because you need to think in three dimensions. Basically, what is the next adjacencies, the biggest set of adjacencies, the biggest set of ones? They look like this. These are all adjacent to each other. Again, you can convince yourself that that's true. Uh, Basically, C's value changes, 0 and 1 over here. Uh, but D's value is 0 over here. So you get D bar. And then over here, A's value changes, but B's value is 0. So you get B bar. So this is B bar, D bar. Right? So these outputs are 1 only if B bar, D bar is true. And again, you can convince yourself. Basically, we, we came to this without simplifying the equation at all. We're just looking at this picture over here and thinking about how things are adjacent to each other and reasoning about what the function, uh, what is the minimal uh, expression of the function that would lead to those ones. Okay, now we've covered these ones. We've covered these ones, and you can see that these overlap, but I don't care, right? This overlap doesn't matter. The function will e evaluate to one if either of these is true. So it's okay to have these overlaps over here in the circuits. But we haven't finished the function because there is also only one thing that's remaining. That's this one over here. Now we're going to cover that. And to be able to cover that, we want to find, again, the biggest number of ones. There's a power of two that covers that. And you see that this is the only case. Again, adjacent ones, of course. And if you look at this, what does this mean? Here, uh, CD must be 0, 1. So you get C bar D. And then A's value changes. So this is independent of A's value. So you get B, C bar D. Right, that's it. So this function is, has an output value of one with this form. And you can convince yourself this is the minimal form. Be assuming that you've done all the steps right, started with the biggest circle of ones, and then uh, expressed that in the minimal form, and then went to the next biggest circle, next biggest circle, and expressed each of them as their minimal forms, this is the value you should get. So basically, you circle rectangles on the k-map as big as possible without forgetting uh, wrap rounds. Okay, sounds cool? Okay, it is cool actually. <laughs> so I'm going to skip this very simple guideline. You can read of this uh, alone, but let's take a look at, uh, let's, take, let's take a look at another example. Basically, these are readings. So let's take a look at a two-bit comparator again. So now we're going to build a bigger circuit and we want to simplify it. What is a two-bit comparator? Basically, we're going uh, to compare A, B to C, D. If A, uh, this two bits, if A, B, and C, D, these are bits, are equal, this is going to be one. If A, B is less than C, D, this is going to be one. If A, B is greater than C, D, this is going to be one. It's a binary two-bit comparator. And if you actually, every time you start with the function, you need to start with the truth table. You can easily figure out the truth table of this, and you can convince yourself that's the case. Uh, let's, test the, let's, test, let's test one case, for example. 
AB is 1, 1, CD is uh, 0, 0, AB is greater than CD, so F3 must be 1. Okay, good. Somebody constructed at least that part of the truth table correctly. Okay, so now, now let's take a look at, for each function, we're, uh, for each output, we're going to uh, build a circuit. And I'm going to give you two of them, and I'm going to leave you with one. So for F1, fill in the truth table in a visual form. Well, we are out of luck over here. So basically, it turns out this is 1 if AB is equal to CD. That's why there's a pattern over here, right? This function is 1 only in that case. And it's a diagonal pattern. And I put over here uh, the uh, literals over here because if, if you have 1s in these cases, then C, uh, D is eliminated, right? Because D changes, so you're, you're left with C over here. Okay, so how can you specify F1? Start with the biggest circle of 1s that are adjacent. What is the biggest circle? Biggest circle is this. And the next big circle is this, this, this. Okay, so clearly we don't have much choice here. This is really the minimal form of this is really the sum of products form. Because there are no adjacencies in the K-map uh, in one. Well, diagonal is, just, is not an adjacency because once you move from this diagonal to this diagonal, two variables change. This is 0, 0, 0, 0. This is 0, 1, 0, 1. So you cannot eliminate that, right? Remember the uniting theorem? Uniting theorem doesn't apply. That's how we construct our K-map. Okay, so this is boring maybe. F2 is more interesting because now we can minimize F2. So let's fill out our K-map. Okay, this is our K-map. And basically, we start with the biggest circle of ones. We take that. And uh, what does it mean? Actually, because of these, now I can give you what this is easily. This is C, A bar. So it's A bar C. Plus... Now, the next biggest circle of ones. Now, unfortunately, that's only two. That gives us D. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, it's uh, A bar, B bar, and D, because it's only uh, those two over here. And then the next one is this one. That gives us uh, C, uh, C, D over here, and B. So B, C. Uh, B, uh, why is it B bar? That sounds incorrect, right? Okay, we should fix that. That's not B bar. Uh, that should be B. Because B remains over here. Yes, that should be B. Oh, I found an error in the slides. That should be B, C, D, actually. So we should fix that. Please remind me. And F3 is an exercise for you, and this is a good time to finish. So next time, we'll start from here. <laughs>